Light has a number of interesting properties. These special properties of light ensure that we can see our world the way we do. If you take this behavior and program it on a computer, you will get something called a ray tracer. So today we'll take a look at how I did this and how my own ray tracer came about. In order for there to be light, we need a light source. From this light source, rays of light will spread and illuminate the scene. However, only a few of them will reach the camera. So instead of tracing these rays from the source, we'll send them out from the camera itself. For each pixel of the final image, we need to send out a ray and see whether it hits something. If the ray hits an object, we can give the corresponding pixel the color of the object. We'll call these rays view rays, but know that there exist other names as well, like primary rays, camera rays or eye rays. But how do we know whether it hits something or not? Since our mesh is made out of polygons, we'll need to find a way to calculate ray polygon intersections. I ended up doing this in three steps. The first step is to calculate where the ray intersects with the plane in which the polygon lies. There are lots of equations to find this point in 3D, but I ended up using this one which comes from this side. However, these algorithms are often meant for line polygon intersections, which means that you will also have to check whether the intersection point lies in the direction in which the ray is going and not behind it. You can simply do this by taking the dot product of the ray direction and the unit vector pointing from the ray origin to the intersection point. The point will only be truly hit by the ray if the result is positive. Next, we need to check if this point lies inside or outside the polygon. This isn't very easy to do directly in 3D, so I had to split this calculation up into two parts. First, we project the polygon and the intersection point on some axis. In other words, we drop one axis from the coordinates. There's one case where you need to pay attention though, and that is when the polygon is parallel to the axis you want to take out. Then you need to choose a different axis to project it onto. We now have a 2D polygon and a point. The problem got a lot easier, but we're not done yet. To check if the point lies inside the polygon, you can split the polygon up into triangles by taking the first point, connecting it to two different points which are adjacent and making our way down the vertices. Then we can count how many triangles the point lies inside using an existing algorithm. When this number is odd, the point lies inside the polygon. When it's even, the point lies outside it. You'll have to do this for all the polygons in the scene to see which polygon the ray hits first and if it even hits one. Finally, we can set the color of the pixel to the color of the nearest polygon which the ray intersects. If the ray doesn't hit any object, you can just set it to some kind of background color. That might have been a lot to take in, but I can ensure you that the rest of the process is a lot easier. For spheres, the process is a lot simpler, due to the geometric simplicity of this shape. This means that we can replace the three complicated steps we had to do for the polygons with a few simpler calculations, like you can see here. Now we get to the fun part, shading. Until now everything looked very flat and fake. But with shading we can make our outputs look much more realistic. The first thing we'll take a look at is how to create shadows and highlights. As you know, shadow is the dark area where light from the light source is blocked by an opaque body. Thus we first need to find out if the intersection point we calculated is directly lit or in shadow. We do this by sending out a second ray from the intersection point to the light source. This ray is also called a shadow ray or a secondary ray. Now we can just use the code from our ray polygon and ray sphere intersection to check if the ray hits any object on its way. The only extra thing we need to change is that the point of intersection between the shadow ray and an object needs to lie between the ray origin and the light source. So, the distance will need to be less than this maximum distance. 
For now we can just color the pixel black if the intersection point isn't directly lit. Doing this you get this result. This doesn't seem very realistic yet. What I did to improve this was making the angle between the surface and the incoming light also have an impact on the lightness of the shadow, as well as the brightness of the light and the distance between the intersection point and the light source. There is of course a lot of indirect lighting in the real world, but we can just approximate this by not making the pixels fully black. You can see the full code in the GitHub repository that I'll also put a link to in the description. Some more things to pay attention to are invalid self-intersections, where the algorithm thinks that the shadow ray is intersecting the point where it came from. Shadows that can be seen on both sides of polygons because they are infinitely thin, etc. Colored lights can be pulled off by making a part of the color being absorbed. It's also best to make a variable, which I called the shadow multiplier, that you use as a coefficient to multiply the pixel color with. Lastly, I want to say that if there are multiple light sources in the scene, you can just add up the shadow multipliers for a certain point and take this as your final multiplier. For reflection and refraction, we'll also need secondary rays. This time they're not just shadow rays, they act like normal view rays. This means that we'll have a recursive function. In this scene the green rectangle acts like a mirror. Virtual light ray will start at the camera and will continue until it hits an object. We can just calculate this point as we did before. If the surface is reflective, ray will bounce off and continue in this new direction until it hits another object. We could continue like this forever, which we of course don't want. So instead we'll have a variable that indicates the maximum amount of bounces that are allowed. We'll decrease it with every bounce and when it's at zero, we just calculate the color of that point, taking into account things like shadow and returning this color to the previous function call. Now we do the same for all previous hit points. The final color will be a mix of the colors of the objects from which the ray reflected. I did this using a weighted average which is influenced by the reflectivity of the objects. But you could also let some of the color be absorbed in some way. Refraction however is a little more complex. The main recursion ID is the same, but light rays need to get diffracted, which gets calculated using the index of refraction and the surface normal. You also need to take into account total internal reflection and part of the color being absorbed, as well as the color being projected onto the surroundings. I created a little animation for visualization purposes where you can see the view rays being represented by green lines and the shadow rays by red lines. The blue rectangle is fully reflective in this case, so we don't need to trace shadow rays from its surface. To simulate translucency and unclear reflections, I rotated the secondary refraction or reflection ray with some random rotation that's restricted based on the material's roughness value. If there's one phenomenon of light that I absolutely love, it's probably the way it gets scattered by fog and dust particles. Because of those, you can sometimes see the light rays in the air, which makes for some really beautiful effects. Making this work digitally was challenging, but the end result looks surprisingly good given the simplicity of the code. To get good results, we'll need multiple virtual dust particles. So what we'll do is loop through the empty space between the ray origin and the intersection point with regular intervals and calculating the color that that dust particle would have. We multiply this color by the shadow multiplier and take a weighted average between this new dust color and the current pixel color. The denser the particles are packed together, the more they will influence the current color. And that's about it. Armed with this new knowledge, you can certainly make a ray tracer of your own. And I definitely recommend doing a project like this, as I found this incredibly fun to work on. If you don't have any programming experience yet, you can always start learning how to program today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more of this content, subscribe and click the bell icon. Be sure to also leave a comment if you have any tips, questions 
or if you just enjoyed the video. I hope I'll see you soon. Bye!